while the holy city enjoyed total peace and the laws were strictly observed because of the piety of the high priest onias and his abhorrence of wickedness the kings themselves honored the holy place and enhanced the glory of the temple with the most magnificent gifts even to the extent that Seleucus, the king of Asia, defrayed from his own revenues all the expenses required for sacrificial services. However, a man named Simon of the priestly line of Bilgah, who had been appointed administrator of the temple, became involved in a dispute with the high priest about the regulation of the city market. When he realized that he could not get the better of Onias, he went to Apollonius of Tarsus, who at that time was the governor of Colossyria and Phoenicia, and reported to him that the treasury in Jerusalem was so overflowing with untold riches that the total amount of the wealth was beyond reckoning and completely out of proportion to the cost of the sacrifices, and that it would be possible to have it all brought under the control of the king. When Apollonius conferred with the king, he told him about the riches that had been reported to him. The king appointed Heliodorus his chief minister and set him forth with orders to effect the confiscation of the reported wealth. Heliodorus immediately set forth, ostensibly to make a tour of inspection of the cities of Colossyria and Phoenicia, but in actuality to carry out the king's command. When he arrived in Jerusalem and had been cordially received by the high priest of the city, he told him about the information that had been reported, disclosed the true purpose of his visit, and asked if the allegations were accurate. The high priest explained that some of the money was set aside for the care of widows and orphans, and that the rest belonged to Hyrcanius, the son of Tobias, a man who held a very prominent position. In contrast to what the impious Simon had alleged, the total sum amounted to 400 talents of silver and 200 talents of gold. He further added that it would be completely out of the question to inflict injustice upon those who had placed their trust in the sanctity of the place and in the holiness and inviolability of a temple venerated throughout the entire world. However, because of the orders he had received from the king, Heliodorus stated that he had no other choice but to confiscate the money for the royal treasury. And so, on the day he had designated for the purpose, he went in to draw up an inventory of the funds. There was immense distress throughout the city. The priests prostrated themselves in their priestly vestments before the altar and prayed to him in heaven, who had issued the law governing deposits, to keep those funds intact for those who had deposited them. The appearance of the high priest pierced the heart of every beholder, for his expression and his changed color disclosed the anguish of his soul. Terror and bodily trembling had overwhelmed him, clearly indicating to those who beheld him the pain lodged in his heart. People rushed forth from their houses in crowds to make public supplication because of the profanation that was threatening the holy place. Women thronged the streets, girded with sackcloth under their breasts. Maidens, who had been secluded indoors, came running, some to the gates, others to the walls, while still others leaned out of windows, all of them raising their hands to heaven in supplication. It was a pitiful sight to observe the crowd lying prostrate straight in the agony of the high priest in his great anguish. While the people were imploring the Lord Almighty to allow the deposits to remain safe and secure for those who had deposited them in trust, Heliodorus proceeded with his appointed task. But just as he arrived with his bodyguards at the treasury, the Lord of spirits and of all power caused so great a manifestation that all those who had been so bold as to accompany Heliodorus became panic-stricken at the power of God and collapsed in terror. For there appeared to them a horse magnificently caparisoned, mounted by a rider of terrifying mien. Charging furiously, the horse attacked Heliodorus Heliodorus with its front hooves. The rider was seen to be accoutred entirely in golden armor. Then two young men, remarkably strong, strikingly beautiful, and magnificently attired, also appeared before him. Taking their stand on either side of him, they flogged him unremittingly, inflicting numerous blows on him. Suddenly he fell to the ground, enveloped in a great darkness. His men picked him up and laid him on a stretcher. This man, who, but a moment previously, had entered the treasury with a great retinue and his entire bodyguard, 
now was carried away utterly helpless, and those under his command openly acknowledged the sovereign power of God. While he lay prostrate without the power of speech, because of the divine intervention and bereft of any hope of deliverance, the Jews praised the Lord for his miraculous glorification of his holy place. And the temple, which a short time before had been filled with terror and commotion, was now overflowing with joy and gladness at the manifestation of the Lord Almighty. Some of the companions of Heliodorus quickly pleaded with Onias to entreat the Most High to spare the life of the man who was now breathing his last. Fearful that the king might suspect that Heliodorus had met with foul play at the hands of the Jews, the high priest offered a sacrifice for the man's recovery. While the high priest was making a sacrifice of expiation, the same young men again appeared to Heliodorus, clad in the identical apparel, and stood before him. Be very grateful to the high priest Onias, they said to him since it is for his sake that the Lord has spared your life. Since you have been scourged by heaven, proclaim to all people the majestic power of God. When they had said this, they vanished. After Heliodorus had offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made very solemn vows to the Lord who had spared his life, he took his leave of Onias and marched off with his soldiers to return to the king. He bore witness to everyone about the miracles of the supreme God that he had witnessed with his own eyes. When the king asked Heliodorus what sort of man would be suitable to send to Jerusalem on some future occasion, he replied, If you have an enemy or someone who has been a traitor to your government, send him there. You will get him back soundly flogged, if indeed he manages to survive at all. Without question, there is some peculiarly divine power about the place. He who has his dwelling in heaven watches over that place himself and protects it, and he strikes down and destroys those who come to do it harm. This was the outcome of the episode of Heliodorus and the preservation of the treasury.